Thank you, Manu and, and, and uh, Georgia Tech and, and Ocean Visions for this opportunity to speak um, about something that's uh, important to me. And I think to everybody that's on the call, it's important. I'm gonna set my timer so I can be careful not to go over. Uh, I'm gonna take you on a little journey uh, about aqua optimism, which we trademarked uh, Blue Tech and the value of that in the future of the ocean. Did that change? Do you see the second slide now? Yes. Great, okay, so to us aqua optimism is really the power of hope. And particularly for those students that are out there, each of you can help change the world. And for me, problems are opportunities, hopefully for all of us. Blue Tech is critical to identify and then to solve pro the problems in the ocean and to promote a sustainable blue economy. So right away, I think you can see that we believe that we have to be optimistic, problems are opportunities, and blue tech is critical. So some of the power words for us, clusters, which I'll talk about, collaboration, which I think we all know is important, inclusion, inspiration, innovation, which is our theme for our blue tech week this year. My hope is that we can enlist you in this ocean critical hero's journey, which many of you will know what that means. So what is a cluster? Uh, for those that are not familiar and uh, why are they important? Well, there is a concept of a business cluster, which is a concentration of related industries. But when you organize those clusters, when you recognize that something has organically come together, you provide leadership and funding, that's when you create an organized cluster. Uh, we believe that blue tech clusters are critical to protect the ocean by focusing on the triple bottom line. And blue tech cluster both tech and service companies really are the ones that are allowing us, and I, and I by us, I mean professors and students as well, to understand the problems that we've created over really centuries in the ocean. We've been throwing stuff in the ocean from the time in the Vikings and long before. This isn't new, it's just that we've become more aware of it. And I would say it's Blue Tech that's allowed us to, to uh, understand what's going on. On the left-hand side, we talk about the triple helix, and I would say the EU is a thought leader in uh, clusters. So this is where a cluster sits um, in that intersection between academia and education, blue tech industry, and then policymakers writ large. And we have to talk to each of those groups differently. Their needs, their interests are different. But where they intersect and they overlap are in understanding needs and solutions. They all care about economic growth and they care about good paying jobs. So on the right-hand side, clusters are important to promote a growing sustainable blue economy. And we believe that the United States really has not yet woken up to the importance the way the European Union has. Um, there are 3000 estimated clusters in Europe, far, far fewer organized clusters in the United States. So a word about us, just one slide. We are uh, a leading cluster uh, in the United States and in the world. We are a strategic partner with the US Department of Commerce. We receive funding to put together the first ever maritime technology export initiative. Uh, we're about hundred members, including about 10 international. And we're one of the largest, most active clusters in the world. We are two nonprofits. And of course we are the cluster organizer. Our mission statement promotes sustainable science-based ocean and water industries. And in that you can see that we are both ocean and water. So, H2O in the largest extent is what we are interested in. Our tagline is promoting blue tech and blue jobs, which we registered. So it's really important to us to promote blue tech and blue jobs. And we believe that clusters is the best way to do that. We also helped start the world's first and only cluster alliance. We have 10 of the leading blue tech clusters in the world that have come together from eight countries. Our goal is to collaborate. And as you can see in some of the yellow highlights, including on research and development initiatives, and both TMA Blue Tech and the Blue Tech Cluster Alliance will be supporting the work of Ocean Visions. On the left, as you see, clusters collaborate in multiple ways, cluster to cluster, cluster to business, business to business, cluster to government, cluster to policymakers writ large. Uh, we are also trying to help new clusters develop. If you believe clusters are critical to understand and solve the problems of the world, then we should be helping them create in other countries. And in fact, we are working 
to help create clusters in Asia, in Korea, in a prefecture in Japan, in Taiwan. We're reaching out to other countries in Asia. Uh, we've been working with Mexico and Brazil and a couple of very nascent efforts in, in Africa as well. So two quick case studies. Um, I think maybe a couple of my partners from Europe might be on the phone. Uh, in the lower left-hand corner, you can see founding partners for something called ARC, the Atlantic Autonomous Robotics Consortium. What we decided to do, there is no place in the world today where you can have persistent long distance uh, coursework, you know, putting uh, vessels out, so autonomous vessels and sensors and long duration. So for us, we decided to create something. And right now there are maritime uh, robotic centers in Porto in the north of Spain and in the Canary Islands. And in the not too distant future, there will be in the Azores and then south of Lisbon with the military uh, support. And then in Madeira, probably a little bit further out. And our partners are two clusters, the national cluster of Portugal, Formosiano, and the uh, Plocan, the oceanic platform of the Canary Islands. Um, and, and clusters know what industries need and we think can coordinate stakeholders. And this is a great example of how we are trying to do that. And we will expand south and north. And we were talking with National Oceanography Center in the UK and various other people uh, further south as well. Uh, my second case study is that um, uh, we are very involved in, in education what we call blue stem. There's a whole bunch of, bunch of words on here, but you can see blue aqua optimism in the lower left and on the very bottom. And in fact, we have been working with an outside uh, high level team of, of teachers and curriculum writers. And we completed a TK through 12 um, aqua optimism curriculum uh, and resource matrix. It's very exciting. Uh, when I look back on my time at Tume Blue Tech, I think it's one of the most important things that I will have ever done. That's about now uh, aqua optimism and, uh, and uh, clusters and TMA. What I'd like to do now is, is um, uh, really go over to, um, I've got to change one thing here. Actually, I'm not going to. Um, we, I'm also the managing partner of a company called Subsea Sale. And so I'm going to use that as an example of blue tech and transformative technology. I had two technologists come to me uh, that had been involved in a couple of companies, including a company I'd invested in. Uh, I'm an angel investor. I've, over the years, uh, my wife and I have invested in about 30 companies. Right now we're invested probably in about six, but in this case, I took on the role of managing partner. What you see on the right-hand side is a vessel that we sold to the US Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and uh, I had a discussion with them as recently as yesterday. We will be hopefully working together in the future as well. So what are we? What is the need, first of all? Well, the need is that ocean observation needs to be done everywhere to allow humans to understand and work on a sustainable basis with the ocean. And you see this vessel out, uh, and it's very lonely out there. And it's getting harder and harder to get uh, seamen to go out for three months, four months, six months, and particularly after COVID when maybe they've been on their vessels for three or four or five months and couldn't come ashore. So our mission is to develop 100% energy harvesting, innovative, long duration platforms and sensors that are affordable enough to be used globally. It's not enough that just the developed countries can afford very exquisite equipment. And whether you're the military with a bigger budget or your university, or your Marine Institute in Peru or in Zimbabwe who wants to understand what's going, off, off, going on off of their coast or is worried about illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing, IUU. It's going to be disruptively affordable vessels that will change the way we understand the ocean. And again, I hope this is inspiring to you and you will come up with either in, in, innovative technology that we can put on our vessel or a new company that we can help you with in the future. So who we are, we are an innovative developer of unique capable platforms. I'm gonna go through both our monohull, which is an observation oriented vessel and a new vessel that we've, uh, we are going to create, which will be uh, a multi-hulled vessel. 
And then because we are so quiet, and one of the things that people have begun to realize is that uh, we've created way too much noise in the ocean. And so ocean soundscapes is becoming very important. But if the vessels that are going out to listen are also creating noise, it defeats the purpose. And so we are a vessel that is hyper quiet. And because there really was not a acoustic array that worked well on our vessel, we couldn't tow a, a, an array as is typically the case. We've in fact created our own. So on the left-hand side, we are an innovative developer. Everything we do is to take complication and engineer it for simplicity. We are disruptively economical, which for the first time will permit swarming in fleets. Highly scalable, you could take that and pull it up and it could be bigger and we could do more things with it. Uh, we have a minimal signature, acoustic, heat, radar, and visual. And that has uh, great advantages, whether it's for the military or it is for just not having somebody come and take your vessel like it might happen in the Philippines, for example, when fishermen maybe are going to sell it to the Chinese military or think they can cannibalize something off of it. We can always make them visible by putting AIS, uh, automated information uh, identification system on the top or a radar propagation. We can make the, 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 the sail much more visible. So we came from uh, minimal signature, negligible signature, and we can make ourselves visible. So I said, we are sustainable, we're long duration, we're wind propelled, solar powered, and we're always reusable. And we're pr proud to support these six, six SDGs. We have three issued US patents. Our base model, which is our Gen 6, Generation 6, is TR level 9, technology readiness level 9. We also have a provisional patent on a reconfigurable rigid acoustic array, passive acoustic array. I'll talk about that again in a minute. And we have two new provisional patents, one on a healing wing sail, one on a submerging and riding a capsized watercraft. And then one of my partners has developed a magnetometer and creating, using our vessels will allow people to do different kinds of CONOPS. And we of course will be collaborating, we are collaborating with sensor and payload manufacturers to try and reduce the cost and complexity of unmanned missions. Um, I'm not gonna spend any time on this because I wanna leave plenty of time for all of you to discuss, uh, but we have a IP portfolio and roadmap these are the things that we have either issued or provisional patents on, uh, and there will be more. A little vision of our vessel. This is the Gen 6. It's a mono hull. And what you'll notice here at the top, uh, and I put green around it because I was giving a presentation to US uh, SOCOM, uh, Special Force uh, Command, and uh, wanted them to kind of, I wanted to focus on, on just the most important things. And, the wing sail is transparent, hollow, lightweight, floodable, rotates 360 degrees around a fixed carbon fiber mast. And the reason that's important is because it can, can go in multiple directions, but also the fact it's floodable means we can submerge underwater, which is a unique feature. Um, there's solar power generation, a uh, very unique feature, which we also patented, uh, that uh, green uh, circle, a wing sail control mechanism. It looks like a hockey puck, and it keeps the wing sail optimally positioned without the use of an anemometer, so understanding wind speed and wind direction, and a motor that would push it out. Um, we do that passively uh, using tension, a very unique uh, capability, it drops the price really dramatically and it increases reliability dramatically. We have essentially one often moving part. There is no autonomous vessel like this. Everybody else has many, many moving parts, lots of things, very complicated, much more expensive and a lot more than go wrong. Um, we have a servo that manages our rudder. The rudder is that long piece on the right-hand side of the A and the keel is the left-hand side of the A. In the, in the hull, we have ballast and nickel metal hydride batteries, so they could be put on a plane. Uh, as you may know, lithium ion batteries are not supposed to be because of fire damage or fire risk, but nickel metal hydride we uh, decided to go with. Uh, and we have 450 watt hours of, of um, uh, capacity in there. 
And then we have uh, solar power generation on the deck or on the wing sail, depending on what the customer's needs are and how much power they need. We have payload areas uh, above and below the hull and in the cone. And then a payload on the mast, as you can see in the upper right. And then uh, with the float module, the lower section housing uh, will be where we put our ballast tank for complete submerging. But it's a very unique, I mean, again, this whole pop, this concept of a semi-submersible, a wing sail above the water and all the bulk, the bulk of the weight below the water, uh, we patented, it is unique to us. Um, and we are pursuing international patents in addition to the US patent. Um, this is really only possible because of my partners, my technical partners. I'm the networking guy, the storyteller, if you will. Um, but I've got some great partners that are, are really the geniuses behind this and the people that are building it. So I'm just going to go for three or four seconds. The great thing about that is that, I'll go back. The great thing about this is that normally if you were in a sail boat, this is actually a Gen 4. Uh, as opposed to Gen 6. And the reason is we rarely get uh, 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 seas like this. This was a Sea State 4, uh, 25 mile an hour uh, gusts. And the vessel is absolutely upright because all the weight is below the water. And that weight could look like a whale if you were trying to deliver something uh, or preposition something. It could be like a stingray or it can be the hydrodynamic shape that we use, which looks like kind of a torpedo in the bottom, but an A-frame. And it has great laminar flow. And so the water comes around it and we have no wake. Uh, and again, we have virtually no sound. This is a multi-mission capability vessel. Um, cargo delivery and pre-positioning of goods. While we could do that with a monohull, we also are looking at this for a multi-hull, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Communications Gateway, we actually are looking for funding with a uh, Navy partner uh, for that, uh, that we did uh, something called ANTAX, Advanced Naval Training Exercise in 2019. We demonstrated the ability to submerge with a handcrafted vessel, and we also carried around an unmanned underwater vehicle. Um, and so they're really interested in us being able to gather information as vessels go by so they don't have to come to the surface. So we will be subsurface to surface to satellite. Defense applications, many all acronyms, ASW, MCM, uh, you know, any submarine warfare, uh, mine countermeasures, et cetera. Uh, we are a sensor platform to protect marine protected and sensitive areas, exclusive economic zones that are enormous, that nobody can put enough vessels or enough planes out for. Uh, water and weather data, audio and visual data above and below the surface. We can, uh, this original idea came because one of my, my, one of my partners saw a, um, uh, a um, uh, RFP for a uh, request for proposal from NOAA because they couldn't get their unmanned vehicles out far enough before they had to come back because the batteries would die. And so we said, well, gosh, we could figure out how to do that. So our vessel can deliver something somewhere so it doesn't use its scarce electrical um, capabilities, its power, and then release it and it can do what it needs to do. And in the future, we will both move them there and then uh, we could dock with them, bring them home, or recharge them and let them go out again. So again, this is a vessel that has many applications. A big one could have UUV launch and landing platform out in the ocean, uh, weather observation sta station, and much more. And what I hope you will do uh, when we get to the end of this is you think about some applications. Um, why is wind important? Uh, well, I would say one of the things is people are waking up to wind. And Wallinius Marine, which is one of the biggest um, shipping uh, lines in the world, uh, their CEO not long ago said that uh, shipping must become sustainable. And their studies show that wind is, a, is the most interesting energy source for ocean transport. On the right is what we originally conceived, which was a uh, surface uh, catamaran that could also go semi-submersible, which is one of the patents we have. Um, when COVID hit, uh, we were like everybody else. We got shut down. And the way most people sell in this industry is at trade shows. Guess what? Trade shows stopped. Um, so what we've begun to do is uh, harden our vessel so that it will work when it comes out of the box. 
And that's not traditional in this industry. People typically travel to train um, and even do in-field uh, repairs. I'm not saying that's wrong, but if we can make it more like a Sony or a Toshiba TV that comes out of the box and we can make it very easy for someone to use, then I think everybody wins, particularly in a COVID era and a post-COVID era. So we are working on, on uh, making our vessel as, as simple to use uh, as possible. And today, actually, we're launching one of our vessels for uh, a couple of week um, uh, voyage. You can see on the left-hand side, some of my partners and I at the last trade show we attended, which happened to be in San Diego Ocean Sciences, which is a great big show, 20,000 people, uh, haven't been to one since. So this is uh, a, we have a provisional patent on a new kind of, of passive acoustic array. This is a big market, growing market, big naval market, naval, uh, uh, by naval I mean uh, uh, Navy market. Um, and you need different kinds of passive acoustic arrays in order to do different jobs. And so what we have done with a partner organization, which we co-own this technology with a company called Applied Ocean Sciences. Uh, they are a bunch of, uh, uh, there are about 18, I think, people in the company, 12 PhDs, a number from Scripps Institution Oceanography, a number who worked with Walter Monk, a legendary oceanographer. Um, and so with them, we are creating a reconfigurable, rigid, passive acoustic array. Two biggest problems with acoustic arrays uh, is the noise that you have to discriminate against, and then knowing where the hydrophones are, because typically they are, they are uh, in the water, and you need to mathematically figure out where they were vis-a-vis -vis each other to understand, to triangulate on what it is ever it is you are trying to, to hear, whether that's marine mammals or fast vessels or even uh, uh, enemy submarines. So the ability to have a rigid array and an ultra-quiet ultra vessel means we will be able to put the processing right on the array. So this has never been done before. Um, price will be disruptive again, easy to assemble, easy to deploy, easy to store, easy to transport, and there'll be many kinds of users. Another thing that we're doing, uh, my partner developed a, uh, a weather station that can uh, work above water, um, but can also go below water. It doesn't work below water, uh, but we have other ways of gathering information on the vessel, uh, but it creates an affordable in situ surface. And when I say subsurface, uh, it is not observing that particular thing on the right hand side you see. But now you can see when we go underwater, um, the ability to submerge means that we can escape really bad weather. And every other surface vessel has to either flee from bad weather or there are many cases of them being carried 600 or 800 miles away or being destroyed. Um, I was uh, uh, part of a uh, NATO um, Portuguese Navy event, and we will be working hopefully with them later this year. Uh, they were talking about a, a deployable mobile acoustic barrier. Uh, and so one of the things that became very apparent was that we could do that. And, and it doesn't matter that it has to be for, you know, whether it's a submarine or it's an unmanned vehicle or it's marine mammals or whatever it is, the acoustics are different above and below the thermocline. And so our ability to listen at the surface and then also go subsurface uh, is a real um, boon. And to the best of our knowledge, nobody's ever done that, certainly not at a price point that we're talking about. We have the ability to work in, in, in conjunction with each other, to ho hover at different depths. If you want to gather ocean information, current, temperature, et cetera, we will be able to do that. Um, going down is an engineering feat. It's not that it's hard. It's just you got to do it right. And there's equipment we can put on. And I'll make note on the far, lower right, uh, one of the advantages we see is uh, our enemy is going to be long duration is going to be biofouling. So things that grow on the vessel, that happens to every vessel. And, and huge amounts of energy are lost uh, because of the drag created by biofouling. And so we are looking at unique new technologies to put on, uh, but we also believe the vessel rotation, uh, when it goes down, what lives at the surface in sunlight and warmth doesn't like to live in the dark and in the cold and in the pressure. 
Um, very quickly, we have two provisional patents, one on a healing wing sail. Um, the, the problem with autonomous um, multi-hull vessels is that they have a risk, a high risk of catastrophic capsizing. The advantages are they're fast and they can carry a lot. And so we originally thought we would be semi-submersible and then submerge when needed, uh, but we decided there's a better way. And so my CTO and partner came up with a really clever way for the wing sail itself to tilt. All kinds of uses, cargo, uh, supply industry, military, recreational, et cetera. Uh, and we believe that the impact at the bottom, ability to sail low signature cargo vessels quickly to location, hide underwater as needed, deliver to port or shore. The second uh, provisional patent we have related to this is in fact a to, uh, controlled submersion. And if it does capsize, that it can right itself underwater, come back to surface and take off again. And that actually is a prototype that my partners built in New Zealand out and the wing sail is healing. Um, we believe we can de-risk the supply chain, which is important to the military as it is to, to anybody that is delivering. And on the lower right, you can see just a few of the important applications. Expeditionary force supply when it's maybe uh, somebody, the enemy would like to deny you entry. Humanitarian aid, 60 to 80% of every dollar is in the cost is in delivering it to that person. And of course, when you think about a, a tsunami or a hurricane or something coming through, the ports are often going to be damaged, both the storage area as well as just the ability to get in and out of the port. We don't need that. We'll even be able to go up onto the, onto the beach. Inner island delivery and they're increasingly remote islands. So there's lots of uses for this. So again, we have a mono hull that will be for observation. We have a multi hull that will be for cargo. Um, management team, I'll just point out, uh, got a lot of experience. My CTO has been in seven America's Cup, including winning with the Oracle Trimaran from Larry Ellison in 2010. He was the hydrodynamic consultant for James Cameron going to the bottom of the Mariamas Trench and uh, senior scientist for the Stiletto, which was a very fast vessel. Uh, my other partner, one of my other partners also, a uh, lot of experience in maritime robotics. Got a strong board, consultants, number of our partners, we are proud supporters of ARC, which I talked about, the International Wingship Association, and of course, Team A Blue Tech. And now to you. So what are we looking for? For academia, we need analysis of our platforms and sensors. Over time, we will want interns and employees. We are always looking for lightweight, low power sensor and communications, batteries, unique capabilities. We need modeling and simulation, prototyping capabilities. Testing users, including those who would like to publish, and use cases, including ideas of new applications. Uh, the US Army Corps of Engineers was our first client. We have a number of clients pending right now. Um, and in fact, the next week I'll be sending out invoices, hopefully to a couple of those. We also are coming up with, uh, with uh, uh, channel partners. Uh, we're looking for investors and management. And so that's it. Um, I hope, excuse me, my takeaway concepts, aqua optimism is important, blue tech innovation, clusters in the triple helix, education, international collaboration, and you can make a difference. The hero's journey is a, a common template in anything we see, Star, Star Trek, Star Wars, it's the, that the hero goes out, and despite setbacks, perseveres to be victorious and comes home change or transform. And that's what we need you to help us do in order to protect this ocean. So the two questions, how would you use the subsea autonomous vessels to expand our knowledge of ocean science and engineering? And how can the transportation capabilities of our multi-hull enable resilient strategies for coastal systems and communities against the threats of climate change and human pressure? With that, I'm going to stop sharing and thank you for your attention. <laughs>